Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. I, I, I understand how difficult it can be to teach all day and then you got to go listen to some guy talk for two hours. Well, hopefully I'm going to make it as interesting and as engaging as possible for you uh, so that you don't feel like this is like an imposition on you. Um, I've, been, I've done enough time in these seats to know that they're not very comfortable, so I'm going to keep it lively and keep it engaging. And we finish up today at 6 o'clock. So um, I'm going to make it uh, worth your while. Uh, beyond the, the work that I've been doing with school districts, I also have uh, two books out. Well, actually one and a half because the one book, um, both of my books are published through Free Spirit Publishing. You can find it on the Free Spirit website. That's just www.freespirit.com. Um, or you can find them on Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, but the best price is at Free Spirit. Uh, my first book is called Advancing Differentiation, and that really just comes out of all of my work that I did uh, as a teacher of the gift. And what I did was I learned all this stuff pretty much on the job, uh, because I have not met a person yet that went through teacher college saying, I'm going to teach gifted kids. Not, not, I have not met one yet. So um, I got baptized by fire. I fell into it accidentally. Um, my background is theater. Surprise! Uh, so I uh, couldn't make any money at it, and I really love fancy shoes, so uh, I decided I needed to have a job that made a little bit more money than trying to be an actor. Well, then I went into education. Boy, I want a half step up, right? So um, I started, I went through my licensure, my post-baccalaureate licensure program, and uh, I because I was a male seeking primary education, uh, what they did is they, I was hired in the city of St. Paul, bless you, I went to college in the, at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and um, the, I did my student teaching in St. Paul, and I mentioned to the director, we were having a meeting with the director of HR to learn how to apply for jobs, and I said, well, I'm really interested in primary, and she said, come see me. I was like, okay. So I saw her, and she said, you have a contract. What? And she said, we need men at the primary level. So you have a contract, and here's what you do. Uh, once you know a certain time of the year comes along, you're just going to go out and you're going to canvas the buildings. We'll tell you where the jobs are. You go to the building and interview, and you're done. I was like, okay. Well, I interviewed. Uh, my first job that I interviewed at was the theater arts magnet. I got a degree in theater. I'm thinking, I'm in. I'm in. I didn't get the job. I was really mad. But I'm glad I didn't get the job because it all does work out. Uh, the next interview, a couple days later, was at uh, the Gifted and Talented Magnet. I had no idea what it was. But somebody said, well, why don't you give it a try? A talent, you know, it has something probably to do with theater, too. Why don't you give it a try? So I went there, and I interviewed, and I got the job. I was really excited. And I thought I was going to get to do all this theatrical stuff. That was not what that program was about. It was gifted kids, and I fell into a sixth grade classroom. That's where they placed me. And I was scared to death because the kids were almost as big as I was. And they were gifted. And not were they just generally smart. They were truly gifted kids. Well, I relied on what I've always done. I fell back on all of my education in theater. I have a, a, most of my theater education was in children's theater, and I had written plays, or I hadn't written plays yet, but I was doing a lot of children's theater kind of stuff. So I fell back on all that stuff. Turns out now, all of that stuff that I learned in theater school, then I applied it in my classrooms uh, in elementary, were all of those things that we now call creative thinking critical thinking. I was doing all that stuff back in the early 90s and I learned it back in the late 70s, early 80s in my theater work. And here it all of a sudden was becoming the 21st century stuff. So I wrote this book based on all those things that I had accumulated 
as well as work within uh, curriculum and instructional practices. Uh, and some of this, what you're going to be hearing this afternoon, uh, are based on my own studies about how kids' brains learn. Um, you know, when I went to teacher school, I really didn't learn how to teach. I learned what teaching was, but I really didn't even learn that much about it. It was all baptism by fire. And all of this stuff has been really pretty much self-study since. Um, uh, this is really bothering me. Sorry. Um, so uh, that's that's my first book. That's been out for about a couple years now. Uh, I have a new book coming out with my really good friend Diane Hecox, and some of you may know her name. She's done quite a bit in in the field of differentiation as well. Um, also a G called Differentiation for Gifted Learners. Um, this actually is coming out in September of this year. The, the edits are in the final stage right now, so it'll be out in September, also through Free Spirit. So, like I said, I have a book and a half, uh, so check it out. Um, what we're going to do today is... Um, is this bugging you? Is this bugging me? Can I get a diff either something different? Cause this, is it just the cable? Oh, okay. I'm going to take it off. That's I know. I, I, I would. I would use my theater voice, um, but they're recording this, so I have to take it off on a microphone. And then, of course, this one. Okay, there we go. So, um, I've started to learn about this thing about the brain um, probably about 15 years ago. Uh, because I had done my master's in curriculum and instruction, again, I learned a lot about instructional practices, but I kept saying, why? Why? Why are we doing that? Why do we do that? And I, I realized I'd never gotten any thorough understanding about how a kid's brain works. So I always felt like I was a race car driver. Okay, and this is what I think about teaching. Here's my analogy to teaching. I felt like I was a race car driver. So what I was doing was I was driving this car around this track as fast as I could for nine months to race to the checkered flag at the end, right? And so the car was the kid. And I was the, the, the track was the curriculum. And I was racing around there. I was trying to get the kid to the finish line. All of a sudden I realized, wait a minute. A race car driver not only has to know about the car, they also have to know about the track. So I need to know about that kid, so individually about my kids, but I also need to know about the track. So I need to know more about my curriculum and make sure that I know where the bumps are, we'll make sure I know where the potholes are, make sure I know where, where it's going to be turny and curvy and all that stuff. Then I started thinking, but wait a minute. I don't know anything about the engine in my car the kid's brain. I knew nothing about it. And here we are trying to slam all this stuff into this kid's head or trying to expose kids to all kinds of information and we didn't know what the heck we were talking about. So I started studying and started doing my own internal study and research on this as to what is going on with these kids. Now, I want to clarify, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not a neurologist, I'm not a brain scientist, I'm just somebody who's voraciously chewed up and eaten up all this information, tried to digest it, and give you some bits and pieces that you can walk out of here and say, okay, I'm going to go research my own stuff, but I got some pretty good ideas and tips to now apply in my classroom and what you can use immediately. One of these tips I want you to think about is that we have three time zones, what I call time zones in our brain. 30, 15, and 24. The first time zone is 30 seconds. You have about 30 seconds of time to emotionally engage the people, the person, the child. Because our brain is naturally programmed to downshift, to seek out threat. That's what we all do. We're all seeking out threat. Our brain is constantly patterning to find where is the threat that's going to kill me? What is going to kill me? All right? So I'm constantly looking for threat. 
So if I'm constantly looking for threat, what I have to do is when that kid enters my room, I have to help them upshift and say, you're not going to be killed here. I'm going to protect you. I'll, it'll be okay. And the biggest reason I say this is because you have a lot of kids that enter your classroom who fear the curriculum is going to kill them. Math is going to kill me. Because, you know what, I've been beaten up by math for how many years? And I'm not good at it. So every time I go into a math class, I'm downshifting where I'm fearing for my survival. So what I want to do is I want to make sure that I get my kids to upshift when they walk in that room. Simple, simple things like just saying their name. Good morning. Glad you're here. Or saying, well, how did the game go last night? Simple things. Looking kids in the eye. Saying good morning to them. Just the, the, the greetings are those things that can help kids upshift. Um, any of you work with kids in poverty? Holy smokes. Yeah. Um, your kids are downshifted a lot. And now that I know that I've got so many in here that are working with kids in poverty, what I'm going to share with you is a, a lot about the research that's happened, that's been coming out about kids in poverty. And we know that kids in poverty, their brains are downshifted more often than is anyone else's brain. And that downshifting is causing a lot of chemical reactions within their brains that's flooding their system with the stress hormones. And those stress hormones don't know good from bad. Stress hormones don't know good stress from bad stress. And stress hormones don't, it's either on or off. There's no, you know, there's no five on that scale. It's either one or 100, okay? And so when it floods your system, most of us are able to get rid of it relatively quickly. And when you get rid of it, it your body then floods itself and kind of flushes itself of, of those, those stress hormones. But when kids are living in, in poverty, they're in stress a lot. And the research is really clear on this, that kids that live in poverty have more medical health issues, they have more emotional health issues, they have more long-term issues, and they're citing now that it's because of that downshift, that in being in that downshift. When you're in that downshift, and you're going to see this as we move through the brain here, you cannot process information in this part of your brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. Okay, I'm sure none of you have road raged before, right? But if you know somebody that road raged, you know that they're doing or saying something that they wouldn't necessarily do if their mother were in the car, okay? They're doing things that they go, oh God, that was stupid. Or, you ever hear about this, that, you know, before you send that angry email to the parent, wait 24 hours, right? That's a downshift when you do things that you go, oh geez, I shouldn't have done that, okay? So that's a downshift. We're going to talk more about downshifting and how, why it happens and then how to help, uh, help upshift. But I just want you to realize within that first 30 seconds, I want my kids to upshift and I want you to upshift. Notice I'm walking Walking around, I'm walking around intentionally because there is a little bit of stress when I walk around, so that you're not going to fall asleep. And secondly, we start to make an emotional connection because there's proximity to it. So you start, I start looking you in the eye, and I can point at you, and I can, you smile at me, and there's just some natural uh, connections going on here, and that's intentional. All right. So that 30 seconds, I want kids to know, I want you to know, I want you here, and I'm so glad you're here because. I'm going to teach you something today, and I'm going to take you from point A to point B, okay? The next one is 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Now, actually, this one has changed dramatically from when I first learned about it. 15 minutes is about the amount of time that your brain can pay attention to any one particular thing, okay? And let me clear, I'm going to do a lot of clarification of language here today. The, what attention really means is the ability to filter out distraction. That's what attention is. So when we say, I just can't get your attention, well, that's because there are distractions that are much more important or more survival-based or more engaging than what you may want your students to do. So realize in that 15-minute segment of time, the brain can pay attention. 
Now, that's actually gotten shorter with, with our 21st century learners. It's gotten a lot shorter uh, because of technology and the, 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 the amount of information that's flowing at these kids. So their attention span is a, a, even shorter now. It's about between three and seven minutes. Yeah, three and seven minutes. So just think about if you're a teacher that likes to talk a lot, and what teacher doesn't like to talk a lot? That's part, that's part of our joy of doing what we do. Well, we've got to realize that those kids are not necessarily paying attention to us. Okay? Because their brain cycle has gone off. Now... In any classroom, you're going to have 30 plus different cycles going on because everybody's cycle is different, okay? And so to make sure that I get all of my kids on a similar cycle and making sure that I'm paying attention to this, and this is one of the differentiated strategies that I use in the classroom, is that to make sure that I'm paying attention to that cycling that's going on in their brain, I want you to live by this little rule here in your classroom. There it is. It's called Richard's Rule. I'm becoming really famous with this. And Richard's Rule says, for every 10 minutes of singular modality instructional practice, is what I call didactic instruction, where I'm talking at you, okay? Or you're doing one modality of something. You're going to view a video, okay? That's singular modality. What you need to do is spend up to two minutes doing something else with that information or using another modality. So for 10 minutes, I can talk at you, and then we need to spend up to two minutes of doing something else. And you're saying, wait a minute, Mr. K- Dr. Cash. Um, I've got 43 minutes. And I got all this curriculum I have to cover. And you're going to tell me that four times within my session I'm going to have to break for, for up to two minutes? Sure. But I got all this stuff to cover. Well, you're going to cover it. They ain't going to learn it. Okay? You've got to give their brains time to process information. All of us need time to process information. I'll guarantee you if I don't live by this rule in this session... What's going to happen is you're going to walk out of here with one of the first things I said because that's novelty and one of the last things I say because that's immediate memory. Everything else in the middle is a jumble because rule number one, well actually um, you've heard your brain is like a sponge, right? Myth number one, it is not like a sponge. It is more like a sieve than a sponge. Seriously. Your brain is more like a sieve than a sponge. What it's doing is it's sieving out information that it doesn't find to be important, interesting, novel, determined upon on survival. It's letting it go. It is holding on to chunks of information. And those chunks of information are bigger than the hole in the sieve. The filtering systems. And those are then either stored or gotten rid of if they're taking up too much of the prefrontal cortex. Because you're storing it all right here. Immediate memory and working memory is all right up here in the prefrontal cortex. So if you don't use it, you have to get rid of it so you can provide more space. Okay. So if I want kids to chunk information and dump it, or process it and get rid of it or move it off to someplace else so they can open up their brain, I'm going to use 10 to 2. Now, you'll notice it says 20 to 2. I'll let you go up to 20 minutes. I'll pro- I just did 20 minutes. We're doing 20 minutes right now. However, I've been doing a lot of interaction with you, so that's been a little bit better. So, what I want you to make sure you do in your classroom, 10 minutes, you got to have them do something with it. They turn and talk to a neighbor and say, what did you do? What did you just hear me say? This is a good one. This is actually one of the best ones. Turn to a neighbor and tell them what you just heard me say. Because I I can't tell you how many classrooms I go into and I hear teachers say, got it? Okay? Well, good? Of course I can say, yeah. And then you go, well, why aren't you doing it? Um, Because I don't know what it is. Okay, so you've got to make sure they know what it is. Say, turn and tell your neighbor what you just heard me say. Repeat it, okay? Though that's some of the strategy. Some of it's just going to be get up, stand, and stretch. Because right now, and I know these chairs are not very comfortable, your body is succumbing to gravity, okay? Your brain only processes information with oxygen-rich blood. 
Well, here is where your brain is kind of like a sponge, where it's holding on to the blood, okay? But you hold it right here, and if I don't move it around, what happens? The blood drips out of it, right? Because it succumbs to gravity. So right now, the blood in your body is pooling in the two lowest points of your body, your back end and your ankles. Not a lot of good thinking back here, okay? So what I need you to do is, is every now and then, I might just say, okay, let's just stand up and stretch. In fact, let's do that. When I say go, you're going to stand up, you're going to stretch, you're going to turn around, you're going to see who's around you, you're going to say, hi, my name is, and then I'm going to say, wrap it up. That means you're going to wrap up what you're doing, and then I'm going to say, stop, and then you're going to sit down. Okay? So what are you going to do when I say go? What are you going to do when I say wrap it up? Wrap it up. What are you going to do when I say stop? See, I didn't say got it. Okay, I'm asking you to repeat it to me. Go. say wrap it up because I want to give kids to finish up their conversations. I don't want you to drop and stop, okay? So I'm always going to tell you to wrap it up. All right. I'll talk more about that engagement period. I'll talk more about the survival stuff. I'll be talking more about that as we go along. Um, The last number up there is 24. It's about one of the only good reasons to do homework. 24. Yeah, it's not not working for me. Uh, Hold on one second. Definitely not going to win the Oscar for this performance. Um, uh, The last number up there is 24 hours. 24 hours. Your brain can hold on to information that is brand new information for about 24 hours before it starts to disintegrate. So if I told you my phone number is 612-670-0278, we practiced it a little bit, you thought about it, we did stuff with it in class, and then I said, okay, now go home, and then the next day I came back and I said, what was my phone number? And you go, 612, uh, I forgot. Because it disintegrates. You may hold on to a chunk because that chunk was 612. That's a Minnesota area code. And so you remember that and you just held on to it, but the rest kind of disintegrated. So one of the only good reasons to do homework, because most of the research on homework says there's little to no effect on an academic achievement through homework has little to no effect on on achievement. Um, In fact, in most cases, homework has a negative effect on achievement because it has turned kids against wanting to study. Um, The session that I'm going to be doing right after this one for the parents, but you're welcome to come because there's a lot in there for teachers too, is on self-regulation. That is a good reason to do homework, to teach kids how to self-regulate, how to go home and study. And if, because we're all here kind of for the gifted kids, gifted kids don't learn how to self-regulate because they never have to learn how to study. Because studying isn't a part of the vernacular because they don't, they memorize that stuff quickly and they're done. Okay? We're going to, and I've been doing, uh, I did a session this morning and then two days with secondary teachers on, on curriculum and instruction for advanced learners. And what I keep saying is stop dealing so much in the factual level of information and let's move into the procedural and conceptual levels because you can't go home and memorize the conceptual level. You can go home and memorize your timetables, but you can't go home and memorize the concept of multiplication. Okay? So what I want to do is when I'm going to send kids home with information that I want them to do some sort of repetition with, I'm going to have them think more broadly about it because as soon as I have them think more broadly about it, they're connecting it to other information. And I'm going to have them do it in multimodal ways. They're going to use multiple modalities. And the modalities are speaking 
seeing, saying, touching, and so forth. So it's your senses. And so what I want to do is I want kids to take stuff home and practice it using multiple modalities. Go seek out multiples in your house. Go look for things that multiply. Okay, That's a better use of their time than just sitting there and memorizing information. Now, um, so realize that 24 hours is the amount of time that it, that it will uh, take information to then start to disintegrate. All right? So that's, that's just kind of a rule that we're going to use now during the session, 10 to 2, 20 to 2. Sometimes I'm just going to have a turn and talk to a neighbor so you can kind of remember or refresh that information. All right. Uh, I'm going to do a little conversation here about the 21st century learner because I've already talked to you a little bit about how uh, they are different. Um, but, uh, but look at that cartoon. That's a, a baby in a bassinet in a viewing window of a hospital. And his phone is going off. And somebody, you know, he didn't get the message that he's supposed to turn his cell phone to vibrate. And he says, oh, man, sorry, guys, that's me. You know, that's not too far from the truth. Even though it's a joke, it's not too far from the truth. I w- work in a suburb of Chicago. I'm working with a school district there. And uh, when I presented this information to them, I, a, a teacher raised her hand and she says, you know, I have a 10-month-old and she takes my iPad and can open it up using the code and can go and find her games, can look up pictures and actually starts to go on the internet. 10-month-old. I'm 55 and I'm still having a trouble getting on my iPad, okay? So their world is different. Their world is dramatically different than ours. So our 21st century learners are right now being taught by 20th century trained teachers. And in some cases, your 19th century trained teachers, because that professor probably hadn't been in the classroom in 20 years. Okay, and so they're using stuff that they learned. Now, I'm not saying that the training was bad, but the kids that we're dealing with are different. Our training may not have necessarily prepared us for this new culture of kids. We're using a 19th century curriculum design, which means that it's all the widgets came in looking the same, and they're all going to look the same going out. That's not the way it is. Our kids are going to be performing jobs that don't even exist right now. In fact, they're going to create their own jobs. They are in a culture where they're not going to be working for the massive Fortune 500s. They're going to create their jobs. They're going to create websites. They're going to create businesses. If they have an iPhone, they've got a business portal right there. Because you only need to have the internet access to build, build your own business. 17th century assessment methodologies. We're still using them. The rank and order. And I'm really disappointed, but I'm actually getting a little bit happier um, with standardized testing. Standardized testing is purely about rank and order. It has nothing to do with how what kids think. But I have two friends that are actually sitting on the Smarter Balanced uh, Advisory Board for their assessment program, and I'm constantly telling them, you know, this is what I think we should make sure that we assess. Thinking is harder to assess. It's not a quick down and dirty, we can't do a paper and pencil test for thinking. I want to see proficient thinkers because, you know what, my social security is gone. I'm going to live on their Social Security when I'm at Social Security age. So I want them still making money. Okay? So I want them productive because that means that I'll be still you know, living okay. So 17th century assessment methodologies are wrong for our kids. Um, and we're in a 15th century structure. School has not changed since the 1500s, and I don't think these chairs have either. Okay? So this is a 15th century model. And we're in the 21st century. So what we're going to be thinking about, what I'm going to really be pushing you on and getting you to critically analyze, are what are those things that we're doing that are are the antithesis of the 21st century and are not going to address the needs of our kids' brains, okay? So these things don't work for our kids anymore. Just because they work for us does not mean they're going to work for them. If we teach the same way we taught yesterday... For our kids today, we rob them of their future. I'll say that again. If we teach the way we did yesterday, we are going to rob our kids of their future. I didn't make that up. That comes from John Dewey, who said that in 1944. And we're still struggling with that. We've got to think differently now. So, 
brain-based or brain-compatible learning. It's moved from brain-based to brain-compatible, so I'll probably flip back and forth on those terminologies. There's four kind of principles that we will live by or that we have to keep in mind as we think about uh, how to make our learning environments more compatible for our students. Now, because I know this is being put on by gifted, most of this is generalized to all kids, but I'm going to constantly be throwing things about gifted in here, okay? Because most of you, I'm assuming, are gen ed teachers, correct? Okay. So, first and foremost, it's got to be a safe and non-threatening environment. If that classroom in any way, shape, or form is threatening, that kid is going to downshift. If that kid does not feel safe, that kid is downshifted. And again, our kids that live in poverty are coming in in fear. They're coming into the school in fear. I've done a lot of work in uh, New York City and uh, Chicago and the far northern reservation, Indian reservation in Minnesota. Uh, And those kids are in generational poverty and they're in constant fear. Uh, Alcoholism, abuse, sexual abuse, and on and on and on. And one of the things that we have to do is make the school very non-threatening and very safe. In fact, the school uh, that I'm working in in northern Minnesota uh, was the site of the Red Lake uh, shooting uh, about 10 years ago now. Maybe it's not even that long ago. And so they had to, those schools that have had those shootings, what they've had to do is they've actually tried to redesign the buildings so the kids don't see the same building as they come in because then there's a whole fear factor that goes on with that. So it's not just your classroom that has to be safe. It's got to be the whole school environment that needs to be safe. How safe do they feel on the playground? How safe do they feel in the lunchroom? How safe do they feel on the hallways? And now that we're turning schools into fortresses, my fear is is that kids feel like they're coming into an unsafe place. So we're going to have to think about how do we shift that mindset that these kids have that school has to be barricaded. And I just, I cracked up when the NRA said teachers should carry guns. Oh, that's going to make it better. Yeah, no, I don't want to see kids or teachers walking around with a pistol in their holster and then we're back in the wild, wild west here. We've got to make sure kids feel safe. And some of that feeling safe is that interpersonal connection with the adults and interpersonal connections with each other. This is why bullying has such a detrimental effect on learning. Because when you don't feel safe, you're downshifted and you can't think in this part of your brain. Okay? Next is it's got to be stimulated and varied. So the environment needs to be enriching, which means that we cannot do the same things over and over and over again. All right? Um, remember Charlie Brown's teacher? Wah, 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 wah. Well, that's because she did everything the same way. So your brain actually starts to tune out things that it's going, it knows is going to happen. Uh, so when you drive home, and you've ever said, my car just knows the way to work in the morning, or my car just knows how to get me home, right? I wish I had a car that did actually do that for me, but that's not true. Your brain is actually filtering out information that it knows what to do kind of in repetition, okay? And when you instruct in that repetitional way, the brain starts tuning it out, saying, oh, I know she's... And, and I, this is really what was said to me by a little kindergartner. I was called into a classroom because I, as the director of gifted programs, um, I oftentimes got called into classrooms to come observe kids. And one of the things that I had said to my district is that before any kindergartner or first grade child of color, specifically African American male gets identified for special education, someone from the GT department has to go in and observe for at least 20 minutes. That's all. Just give us 20 minutes. And I can tell, I've been doing this for long enough, that 25 years of work with primary and middle school kids, I can spend 20 minutes in a classroom tell you that kid is gifted or that kid's just naughty. I know the difference, okay? So I got called into this classroom because the teacher was saying, he's just naughty, he's just naughty, he's just naughty. So I come in there, and it was a first grade classroom. And I'm sitting in the back, you know, with my official little badge on, and the teacher starts to instruct and give the directions of what they're going to do. Okay, he sat there, and then all of a sudden, he started to rock. He was sitting, you know, sitting in his, you know, with his legs crossed, and all of a sudden, he started rocking back and forth. And she kind of gave me the wink of, see, it's happening. And he's rocking back and forth, rocking back and forth, and all of a sudden he rocks himself over. (laughs) 
he rocks himself over, and then he starts to roll. <laughs> she, and she kept looking at me. See? Kept roll, and then all of a sudden, he rolled out the door. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. He rolled out the door, and so then she, I told her, "Don't do anything. Let let you know. Let this take its course. Don't stop him just because I'm there." He rolled out the door, and so I thought, "Let's you know make sure he's okay." And I go out in the hallway, and there he is, organizing the boots under all the coats, making sure backpacks were up against the wall, and he finished his little job. And he came walking back in the room and rolled back into place. So then the teacher says, okay, everybody get to work. So little Jamal goes over to his desk and he stands there like this. And she's, Jamal, sit down. Jamal, sit down. Jamal, I mean, five times. Jamal, sit down. He'd sit down and about two seconds later, he's back up on his knees. So I said, hey, Jamal, come with me. Come with me. Um, I said, my name is Dr. Cash, and I'm you know, here watching class. And I said, I noticed that your name gets called a lot in here. And he says, yeah, I think she just really likes me. <laughs> and I said, okay. Um, but I, I also noticed that you, and he goes, yeah, I went in the hall. I said, well, you actually rolled into the hall. And he said, yeah, Why? Because I know she's going to give directions five times. I heard it the first time. I didn't need to hear it the other four times. I said, okay. Went back to the teacher and I said, first of all, what does it matter that he's sitting, he's kneeling at his desk? What does it matter? And I said, did you ever think about how little he is? And that reaching that desk is uncomfortable. And so kneeling on his chair is actually comfortable for him. Okay? And I said, secondly... He rolled out the door because I heard the directions five times. He only needed to hear them once. Some of your kids do need to hear it five times. But there are ways that we might be able to do this differently. So the environment was not stimulating for him. So what he did is he stole the stimulation from her. And this is what you got to remember, that your kids are going to steal the stimulation from you. We are all naturally want to be stimulated. Guys will do a thing called auto-stimulation, and no, it's not what you think it is. <laughs> if you notice a guy around you and their leg is bouncing, or you got a kid that taps his pencil incessantly, that's called auto-stimulation. That means that they're giving you a signal, move me. Get me up and move me. Most of the times that the kids are wiggy and out of control is because they need more movement. And by the way, An adolescent who's third grade on up needs more physical movement than does a kindergartner. Their body is going through all kinds of signal changes, and it hurts after a while. So you want to get them up and move around. That's part of the stimulation. Simulations are part of stimulations. Play acting, getting them to hands-on stuff is a part of that. And we're going to go more into those things. Active and meaningful learning, which means that... Now, um, now you've heard the terms relevance and meaningfulness. I'm going to clarify those terms for you. Relevance means I can connect it to me. I can connect it to myself. So if I'm learning about the rainforest, why do I care about the rainforest? I'm probably never going to go to the rainforest. Or if I do go to the rainforest, it's because I'm going on an eco tour and they're going to tell me about it when I get there. I don't need to know about the rainforest in second grade. That's not what we're learning. But what we're learning in second grade when we're using the rainforest as a vehicle is we're learning about this idea of a system. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get my kids up and I'm going to actually have them act as a system. What kind of systems do you know? And then we're going to start acting as a system. And we're going to get them actively engaged in what is a system. And then that meaningfulness, where do you live within a system? And then the meaningfulness means that they can attach it to do something with that information. Relevance, I can attach it to myself. Meaningfulness means I can use that information relatively quickly. Okay, so active and meaningful. Because it uses all parts of the brain. And then the, other, the final thing there is about accurate feedback. Accurate, efficient, and relevant feedback. We've got to give kids feedback quickly to change and get them to, get them to help change. Now, feedback is not good job. That's not feedback. That's praise. And that usually is praising the achievement, not the effort. 
So what I want you to think about is when you're giving feedback, feedback should always be kind of in the, the sandwich model or the cookie model. You know, you say, this is what you did well, here's how you can improve it, and this is what else you did well. So it's kind of a Oreo cookie kind of thing. So accurate feedback needs to tell the kid what they need to do to get better. Okay? This is one of the strategies of moving kids from that et- extrinsic motivation to the intrinsic motivation. When you tell me what I've got to do to get better, I can do it. All right? So, because I've gone over 10 minutes here, all I want you to do is just turn and talk to a neighbor and say, what are those four things and what are the things that maybe you're not doing as well in your classroom of those four principles? Turn and talk for just 30 seconds. Go. Wrap it up. And stop. Good job. All right. All brains function the same way, but not all brains learn the same way. So we can trace a pathway of almost all of us kind of generically how information kind of transgresses through our brain. But how we actually learn is different. Everybody has a little different learning way, okay, preferences, modalities, and so forth. What we're going to talk about here is just kind of that pathway that information takes and validates those four principles of of the brain-compatible classroom. And I'm going to be giving you ideas as we go along about to nurture that part of the brain. There are those three parts there. I'm just dividing it in three. I love the number three. Three seems to be manageable. I can understand it and so forth. You know, it says the hind brain, so it sits at the back of the brain. And then there's the midbrain, which actually a dotted line means that it's inside of that part of the brain. And then we have the cerebral cortex, the largest part of the brain. And you'll notice that this little guy is facing that direction. So we're looking at the outer part of his left hemisphere. Um, You've heard that there's this right brain and left brain stuff. Okay, myth number two. You don't have a right brain, you don't have a left brain. You have a left hemisphere and you have a right hemisphere. And what they do is they do do different, somewhat different functions. However, they work as a whole. Unless you've had a spherectomy and then you don't have that part of your brain, but your brain is highly plastic and it will shift around damage. So if you've got a damage to a part of your brain, had a stroke or been you know, hit in the head or whatever, your brain will naturally detour around the damage. But, you know, just like kids that have OT or PT or speech therapy, there's some sort of misfiring going on. And so what we're doing is we're actually teaching the brain to route around it, to detour around the damage. Um, The left brain, right brain stuff is not true because that uh, assumes that they work independently of each other, and they don't. They work very dependently upon each other. Um, and, And, yes, the left hemisphere is much more logical and sequential in its processing. The right hemisphere is more abstract and more in the creative side, the language-based side. So realize that, that the, the, the two sides of the brain actually do have to coordinate and work together. So um, we're going to start off in the hind brain. Now you, I only gave you the, I intentionally worked the slides the way they are uh, so that yes, you do have to take notes. I may not give you all of the slides because if I wrote everything in the slide, then I don't need to be here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm give, I gave you kind of skeletal slides so that you can uh, fill in your own information there. This back part here, now, now what we've done is we've removed, we're still, the little guy is still facing this way, but we removed the left hemisphere. We removed that and we're looking 
looking into the right hemisphere now. And as we look into the right hemisphere, we can see the brain stem and the cerebral cor- er, and the cerebellum, which is right here. This is the brain stem and this is the cerebellum. This is what is called the hind brain. It's actually the oldest, less evolved part to our brain. By the way, our brain is a product of our history and a product of our development. Okay, it is based on our history as an as a, a living being from you know thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago, all the way to today, as well as our development from prenatal all the way up to death. Okay, so it develops in this sequential way, both all three ways. Okay, so the first part of the brain that actually develops first, and what was considered to be the earliest part of the brain that has the lowest evolved parts of the brain, is the brain stem right here, this part right here. The brain stem, first part of the brain that's developed and what it is is kind of a scaffold that's built during the baby's development and that scaffold is all the neurons start crawling up it and all the glial cells start moving up it and it forms kind of this structure for the base of the brain. The brain stem basically has two functions. The first one is to monitor, control, and modulate all of the autonomic systems of your body. Autonomic systems of your body being, give me an example of an autonomic system. Okay, respiration, circulation, digestive, musculature, neural, all that stuff. Okay, those are autonomic systems. So, what do I mean by autonomic? Autonomic means I don't have to think about it, it just happens, it runs on its own. Because if we did have to think about those things, blood pressure, respiration, dilation of your eyes, all that stuff, you would literally go insane because you couldn't do anything else. Okay, So something has to run them without me thinking about it. It's unconscious. It just happens. However, the second thing that it does is it's monitoring and filtering information that comes in through the senses, through that avenue, through the brainstem. And what it's doing is it's processing that information and say, hmm, do I need to pay attention to this? Is this going to kill me? If it's going to kill me, then I need to do something with that information. I need to send it to the right place to be processed. So it's a filtering system. And in some cases, our kids may not have good filtering systems there. So think about your kids that are ADD, ADHD, autistic, all that stuff, all the, the, the letters in the alphabet. That's probably because some of them may have a lack of a filtering system at that point within their brain and it's allowing too much information through or the wrong information through. So this is where um, some of that biofeedback stuff is coming into play for when special ed works with kids or medication in some cases can help with that, can help with the filtering system. So it's basically a filtering system. So it's running the autonomic systems of your body and your uh, and the rest of your systems and then it is also a filtering system okay I'm very simplistic here very very simple it's even it's a lot more complicated than that but I'm just kind of narrow boiling it down the next part to the brain uh, hind brain is right back here which is called the cerebellum and I, my little light doesn't show up here there it is there's the cerebellum right there uh, the cerebellum the word cerebellum actually means old brain And what was considered a long time ago is when they first started studying the brain, um, what they thought was because it mirrored or looked like an old part to our brain, that that was the original brain of original humans. Um, That's not necessarily the case. Um, However, that part of the brain doesn't really do any what's considered cognition. That part of the brain is very simplistically uh, uh, like a storage container. Okay, and it holds on to basically two types of information. One is called procedural knowledge, and the other one is considered like factual knowledge. Okay, so uh, factual knowledge is, you know, what is your phone number? What is your address? What is your name? What was your mother's name? All of that stuff that you can recall, okay, that stuff is just stored back there. It's just, it's just placed back there in this hiding, okay? Two times two is four. Four times four is 16. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, H, A, K, L, M, N, P, okay? All that stuff is stored back there. Now, why do you think I sang it? And that's how I learned it, okay? Realize when we're going to store factual information back there, the most efficient way to retrieve it 
is through the pathway of which I learned it. Okay, let me give you an example. I graduated from high school in 1976, okay, and the prom that year was The Stairway to Heaven. Okay, for the youngins, don't worry about the name of the song. But it was a song, a popular, popular song in the 70s, late 70s. And at, of the day, I learned to sing every word in the song through the music. Now, when I rent cars, I always go to uh, 70s on 7 on Sirius, and that song will come on, and boom, I'm singing the song. Full voice, I know every word. And it's like, wow, that was 30-some years ago, and I still remember it. But if you said, well, then tell me the words, I can't do it. Because that's the neural pathway which I created to retrieve that information was through the song part, okay? So if I want kids to have what I call neural efficiency or what is called neural efficiency, what I want them to do is I want them to develop multiple pathways to get that information. Here's a little side on gifted kids. Gifted kids create neural pathways more rapidly. Gifted kids are more neurally efficient than the general population. They gather information quickly, they store it, and they can retrieve it quickly. This is why, and I actually hate this, when you watch like uh, uh, TV shows or, or like talk shows and they bring that little kid on and he can, he can tell you all 50 states and all 50 capitals, like he can throw it up. And they say this kid's gifted, who's smarter than a fifth grader, that kind of stuff. In fact, they called my school in, in Bloomington. They called me and wanted me to audition kids for the show, who's smarter than a fifth grader, because we had this school for highly profoundly gifted kids. And I said no, because that has nothing to do with giftedness, the ability to regurgitate information. They can do it, but that's not what I'm teaching my kids. I'm teaching them to think more deeply and so on and so on. So I actually don't think that that's a valuable tool for the 21st century, because you know what? My phone can pick it up faster than I can recall it. Okay, That kind of information, that factual information, in most cases is not that valuable anymore. However, ask a math teacher, should they learn their math facts? Yes, they should, because it makes the next process more efficient. Okay, And that they should be able to understand the concept of estimation via multiplication, but I want them to have that 0 to 9 in efficiently, okay? in the brain efficiently. The next type of information that's stored there is what is called procedural knowledge. Now procedural knowledge, I'm using that right now. I'm using procedural knowledge because I'm walking and talking at the same time. I'm not tripping over on my feet and I'm not having to pay attention where my feet are going. Okay, if any of you have a, a pre-walker at home or a walker baby, they're going through the process of developing that part of their brain. They're not very good at it and when they walk they have to pay attention to their feet. Okay? Think about when you learn to ride your bike. You had to pay attention to all that stuff, the balance, the where your feet were, and all that kind of stuff. That's sometimes what we call muscle memory. And so any athletes in the room, the muscle memory that you have is not really in the muscle. It's in that part of the brain. It's actually stored back there. In fact, when they've neuroimaged uh, like, uh, athletes that were even thinking about the moves that they were going to do, that part of the brain lights up because that's stored there very efficiently. So it's storing that procedural stuff. So when I want kids to do something, I have to have them practice it over and over again. Again, because I want to build that neural pathway. Remember, when you build neural pathways, the first path time that they build, it's kind of like cutting through a jungle. Okay, And it takes a long time to get back there. Then once it's there, the jungle starts to grow over. It's not being retrieved. So then you have to whack back through it to get it back. But the more you walk up and down that pathway, the more efficient it becomes and the faster that information is retrieved and then stored. Okay? So, little 10 to 2, stand, now this one's a stand, turn, and talk. When I say go, you're going to stand, turn, and talk. And I want you to just repeat what are the two processes of the brain stem and what are the two types of knowledge that are stored in the cerebellum. Go.
All right, wrap it up. And stop. Stop means sit down. <laughs> um, you have uh, one of the last pages in your handout has all kinds of strategies there. Um, normally, if I had more time, I would actually stop and say, what are some strategies you might consider to engage the brain stem, to uh, be protective or be, be per uh, responsive to the brain stem, be responsive to cerebellum. However, you've got all kinds of lists um, in the, one of the back pages of your handout there. Um, and I know I'm not going to get through all of the slides, uh, so there are a lot of suggestions on each each one of those different slides, uh, and I can give you some uh, great resources that are out there as well. Uh, let's move up a level. Now let's move into what's called the midbrain. The midbrain is called the limbic system. Uh, the limbic system is a coordinated set of systems that actually uh, basically monitors and, and uh, deals with emotion and the storage of memory. Now we're moving up in a level of evol uh, evolution here too, so now we're getting Getting a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more complex. Uh, this is where we're uh, actually what the, one of the critical aspects of this is in the limbic system. It uh, sends out chemical reactions, chemical responses to information that's coming from the brain stem. Those chemical responses are actually called our emotions. The chemical reactions within the brain are called your emotion. You cannot control your emotions. Your emotions control you. <gasps> but wait a minute. I've had 10 years of therapy. And now you're telling me I can't control my emotions. I'm going to sue the doctor. No. What your doctor or what your therapist was working on with you was not your emotions. They were working on your feelings. Your feelings are when the prefrontal cortex become aware of the chemical response and actually reads it out and does something with it, okay? So when you react to something, it's based on a chemical reaction that happened within the midbrain. That reaction is oftentimes related to your socioeconomic background, it's related to your culture, it's related to your upbringing, it's related to your, your, uh, your ethnicity, all those, all those things play into that, the reaction, okay? You can't control it. But what you can do is you can help modulate it. This is one of the things that I'm going to talk about the next session. It's about self-regulation. In many cases, kids that are highly deregulated, specifically those coming from poverty backgrounds, is they're deregulated because the parents and the people around them, the adults around them, react incorrectly to those responses. And so what we have to do is teach kids how to act to, to, to be conscious of their actions because they're doing it unconsciously because they've repeated it over and over again. And it's been acceptable to respond that way. So if your parent rages all the time based on stress, well then what do you think the kid's going to do? They're going to rage constantly as well. Um, so they're not going to know. Now one of the things that I'm not going to get to but I want to tell you about is that we're born with a certain set of emotional responses. Okay, we're, and, and that's what a feeling is, an emotional response. We're born with a certain set of them. And that's for survival purposes. We're born with what I call the low end of the keyboard, that sadness or being able to cry about things to tell people what I need versus the high end of the keyboard. That's that happiness. Now, if you've got a little baby at home, you'll notice that the happiness side of the keyboard doesn't develop till a little bit later, okay? But that's still natural. That sense of joy or sense of happiness, my tummy's full, okay, that's natural. Same with the bottom end where I'm sad, okay? Everything else in the middle of the keyboard is learned. Empathy, compassion, trust, building of relationship, ownership, all that stuff is learned. So if I'm in an environment that doesn't have compassion, if I'm in an environment that doesn't use empathy, if I'm in an environment where ownership, there is no such thing as ownership. 
respect for property, okay, those kinds of things, then I'm going to do the same thing. And when a kid steals your pen, oh, sorry, steals your pen, and then you say, well, why did you take her pen? Well, she wasn't using it. There's no sense of ownership. Okay, sorry. Um, So we've got to realize that in some cases, then we punish the child. And remember, just like puppies, kids live in the moment. And if we punish them, that's attention. Their little brains cannot disaggregate positive attention from negative attention. It's attention. It sends out all kinds of singles saying, hey, somebody's paying attention to me. But it may not be the right kind of attention, but somebody's paying attention to me. So that's what's going on in the middle part of the brain there that's sending out all these chemical reactions based on stimuli that's coming into it. Now those feelings, the, the emotional responses are being developed in the prefrontal cortex, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, so, And then the other part to this is that memory is then created because there's a very strong link between the chemical reaction and memories. You will have very, uh, when you have a certain level of that chemical reaction, I don't know exactly what it is, you will have very strong memories. So when you think about the memories you have from school, from your high school experience, from your elementary years experience, those things obviously had a very strong emotion to them, but it wasn't too strong. So it wasn't off the top. Okay, it was just right. It was those experiences where you really felt felt experiential too. Okay? Now, realize that emotion drives attention, which drives learning. What I feel emotional about, what I creates an emotion in me, is going to create a response. It's going to recre- create an attention, which is going to create learning. Okay? Boo! Okay. You just, she just had a classic example, a classic response that's called a reptilian response. Okay? That, and see, now she's all red because she, her body is going through a reptilian response. Okay, she's actually lifted it up to the human part because she's laughing. <laughs> Thank God she's laughing. And she's not <laughs> clutching her chest. Um, she just experienced, and some of you just experienced, what's called the reptilian brain. The reptilian brain functions at the level of a reptile. And many of our kids are living in their reptilian brain. That, when you heard the noise, you weren't clear it was me. But once you paid attention, you knew it was me. But initially, your brain stem said, hey, pay attention to this. This is going to kill you. You jerked because that's the musculoskeletal system jerking, saying, get ready to run. And in some cases, the guys may have lurched forward because it's get ready to fight. So fight or flight, you've heard that before, okay? That's the fight or flight response. Men's eyes dilated to let in more light. Women take deeper breaths because they're going to run, okay? Your heart rate increased because it's starting to pump to get ready to to get out of here. And if you felt a little tingle right after it happened, I'd like to say it was me, but it wasn't me. That was called adrenaline. The adrenaline flooded your system to tell the rest of the muscles, get ready and lurch. The laughter was was the emotional response. The laughter was emotional response because then you realized, oh, he was just kidding, okay? That's what's happening in your brain. That's how quick it happens. And when kids are in their reptilian brain, they're actually in a downshift. That's the downshift. It's that fight or flight place that they live when they're in that downshift. Now, could you tell me, ma'am in red, what's your name? Elizabeth, that's my mom's name. Elizabeth, can you tell me what you were thinking right before I went boo? See, because what happens is everything that preceded it gets wiped away because it becomes innocuous information because the brain wants to pay attention more to the survival aspect than it does to any sort of higher level thinking. So again, what I want to preach to the choir here is that, remember, when your kids are in stress, in that de-stressed position, they cannot think clearly. Kids who live in poverty, if we really wanted to improve the achievement gap, if we really wanted to improve it, I mean really wanted to improve it, we would wipe out poverty first and foremost. If we really wanted to improve it, we'd wipe out poverty. 
However, we make it your job to wipe out, uh, wipe out the achievement gap. And you can't do that because you only have six and a half hours a day. The kids go for 17 and a half hours a day and they're in distress. And everything you tried to teach them about upshifting is gone. Because they go back into those distressed situations. And we're testing the wrong things. Okay, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, so realize that kids in the downshift, I don't care if they're gifted or not gifted, um, that is going to preclude them from doing anything else at the higher levels. So stop scaring them. Don't boo. Don't boo your kids, okay? Get them to upshift. Let's move. Uh, let me, uh, well, we're going to skip past that one. Um, usually what I do is at that point I have you do a brain dump and you've already done your brain dump. I call that when you turn and talk a d- brain dump because I want you to down, uh, dump out information to each other. Okay, I forgot to make a backup copy in my brain so everything I learned last semester is lost. That's kind of true. You do have to bra- back it up. you got to back it up. you got to connect it to other things. And here's where we make those connections in the cerebral cortex. The cerebral cortex is the largest part to our brain. It's about five-sixths of the total area of the brain. Um, it's the most evolved level to our brain. But I would suggest to you it's probably one of the least understood part of our brain. Um, because remember, as we study the brain, we're not studying the brain because we can open it up and look at it and watch it do whatever it does. Well, we cannot see what it does by the naked eye. We have to use fMRIs, you know, functional magnetic resonance imaging, MRIs, but functional means that they're actually thinking about something, doing something with the information, uh, or they're using PET scans or CAT scans, and they're, they're observing where the blood flow is going within the parts of the brain. So we make a lot of conjecture. It's not, you know, it's perfect, but we make conjecture about, well, if this is happening, then we suppose that this is happening, okay? The study of the cerebral cortex is much more complicated than the study of the lower part of the brain, the reptilian brain, because the reptilian brain is kind of just responsive. What's happening in the cerebral cortex can, it can differ from person to person. However, we can kind of generalize some of the things that are happening. Cerebral cortex is the largest. It's five-sixths of the total area. It's where the only conscious thought process is actually happening is in that part of the brain. Um, And realize that your brain is about 78% water. So as you dehydrate, you actually start to go insane. You start because you're not processing. Your brain is starting to cannibalize itself. Okay, so uh, when kids don't have water in the classroom, this is what's happening. They're downshifting because they're trying to survive. Uh, the uh, that cerebral cortex. Uh, well, the whole thing weighs about three pounds. Okay, that three pounds of brain mass consumes upwards of 30% of your total body's energy. This is why afternoon and evening classes are harder on you than is a morning class and after you've eaten a good meal. Okay? If you've taken those all, that Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday graduate class, at about noon on Saturday you're done. You couldn't fill it up anymore. Right? That's kind of true that your brain kind of gets full, but you also get really tired when you're doing advanced levels of thinking. Okay? So we've got to give that part of the brain some time and energy and, and uh, uh, help it do what it needs to do because it's a more sophisticated level of doing. It's not survival. All right? So there are four lobes to the brain. And we're now, again, we're still facing this direction. So we see the four lobes. And, I, and now remember, well, I, I should have told you this at the beginning, that your brain developed uh, in three ways, from bottom to top, so from brainstem to cerebral cortex, from inside, from limbic system to out to the cerebral cortex, and now from back to front, for, so from the, limbic, from the occipital lobe forward to the prefrontal cortex. So it's developed over three ways, bottom to top, in to out, back to front. Okay, So we're going to go back to front now, occipital lobe. The occipital lobe has one job. The occipital lobe processes visual imagery, visual information. It's much more high-functioning with boys than it is with girls. Um, and why would that be? Why would a boy or men have a more high-functioning occipital lobe than, than a girl? Exactly, hunting and gathering. Because remember I said earlier that we are a product of our history. And because men were hunters, visual imagery was much more important. So generally, now remember, generally, boys are going to have better visual imagery comprehension. 
They're going to see things in space better. They're going to recognize color more quickly unless they have a genetic disorder of color blindness. Uh, they are going to recognize movement more quickly. They're going to be distracted by visual imagery much more quickly. This lighting is actually the most difficult on men's eyes and boys' eyes because it's unnatural. Unnatural light does not necessarily affect women as much as it does men because our eyes are much more sensitive to that. We can sense the vibration, but we don't know we're sensing it. Uh, women, uh, Men have better distance vision and better peripheral vision. All these things you need to take into account in your classroom. As you think about the boys in your classroom, the boys are going to be far more distracted by the visual imagery or attached because of the visual imagery. Okay, So always think about that visual imagery. Is it too much or is it just right? Are the colors too much or is it just right? All right. So uh, occipital lobe processes visual imagery. Moving up, then we have the temporal lobe. That's right over the ears here. The temporal lobe processes your auditory information as well as develops language. Here, ladies, is better for you. Women are better at auditory processing and language development. Men are not very good listeners. Surprise, surprise. Now, guys, it's not your fault. It's just you don't have as many temporal lobe connectors in there that helps you process language because being able to process language was not necessarily as important as it is to a woman. Okay, So language and uh, auditory processing are in the temporal lobes. Then you have the parietal lobe that goes across the top. And the parietal lobe is really about movement at will. So knowing if I'm going to move my arms and movement of my legs and all that stuff is parietal lobe. Okay, There's been some very uh, recent studies on parietal lobe development. And what they found is, is that there's a very high correlation between advanced levels of thinking and lighting up of the parietal lobe, which means that the more movement we can provide our students in the classroom, the more likely they are to retain that information and think more at high levels. Let me tell you this. What do you do when you have a problem that really needs to be solved? You don't go sit in the corner and face a corner. No, you go what? You go for a walk, you go for a bike ride, you go for a swim, you go, in, in some cases you might go out in the woods and just take a walk through the woods. Well, that's called a softly fascinating environment. A softly fascinating environment. It's not too overly stimulating. However, it helps me calm down. But think more clearly. Think about this. If you have kids that are ADHD or kids that are highly aggressive, EBD, emotionally behaviorally disturbed, what we need to do is provide them with what are called softly fascinating environments. Don't put them in the pink rubber room. No, where they go is out and sit in the grass and just stare at the ants as they're wandering through the grass. You got to get that kid to calm down. You got to get that kid to calm down all the parts of his brain and all the parts of his body. So you do that through a softly fascinating environment. And the other thing is, our brain seems to have been designed to solve problems of survival in almost constant motion. I'll say that again. Our brain seems to have been designed to solve problems of survival in almost constant motion. Our parietal lobes are telling us, move, 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 constantly. Then the, the final part the, uh, is the frontal lobe. The frontal lobe is the most complex part to the, all of the lobes, and it's the only part where actual higher level thought is happening. Okay, And I'm going to pause at this point because I want you to do a little stand, turn, and talk because it's late in the day, blood sugar's lowing. Okay, So I want you to just stand, turn, and talk and, and say, what does the occipital lobe do? What does the parietal lobe do? What does the temporal lobe do? Go.
All right, wrap it up. And stop. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna, uh, what I'm gonna do, because I, I wanna get to the poverty and, and, and uh, uh, information about race and ethnicity that has to do with the brain here uh, and so I'm going to jump, I'm going to do some quick flip, 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 flip of the slides realize that the information on boys and girls, I've kind of talked to you about that already and I've given you all kinds of suggestions in those slides about boys and girls uh, classrooms are not necessarily designed for boys, in fact we've designed schools uh, for girls uh, in general and that we treat boys like dysfunctional girls so we've got to realize that there's some very strong, there's very strong evidence that the way we do do things in school are detrimental to boys and there's a lot of research that's supporting that saying you know how many boys drop out how many boys get F's and how many boys sit in the office because they're behavioral and all that stuff we've got to realize some of it is cognition and some of it's just the way their brains tuned so we've got to think differently about that so I'm going to uh, quick slide through the prefrontal cortex real quickly then I'm going to jump into the poverty piece and the, uh, so, so the, the, the ethnicity pieces here so prefrontal cortex is the most sophisticated part of the brain. That's all right here. It's all in the very, very front part of my forehead here. And that is doing all of what I call the, it's the CEO or the chief operating officer or ex chief executive uh, officer or functioner of the brain. Um, it's regulating all of, all of your thought processes, your behaviors, and your feelings, what is called self-regulation. Self-regulation requires the use of your prefrontal cortex. Kids are not very well self-regulated as little kids, but that's normal because they, it develops more as they grow up. That's why elementary teachers, primary teachers, have very structured rules and regulations. In kindergarten, we follow lines. Okay, this is why we go to kindergarten, so we learn how to follow lines. Okay, and because that helps us stay within the lines as we're driving on the freeway. Okay, that requires a lot more self-regulation. And I'll tell you, driving down here this evening because I'm up in La Jolla, there are a lot lot of deregulated drivers out there today. So self-regulation is really what's happening here and sometimes you'll hear it as executive functioning. The executive functioning, self-regulation are all kind of synonymous with each other. Uh, what we're looking at is what are my cognitions, what are my thoughts, what are my behaviors and what are my feelings and this part of the brain right up here is doing all of that. It's also doing the most critical level of thought process too. It's the only conscious part to your brain. This part is only about 2% of the total brain area, so that's the only conscious, really conscious part of what's happening in your prefrontal cortex. You can actually turn it around. This is what your therapist is working on when you go to therapy, is working on turning around the way that that part of the brain processes information. Um, it synthesizes the inner and outer worlds. It's helpful for that critical emotional regulation. And I love this quote, the most common determiner of failure to self-regulate emotional responses is the lack of emotionally consistent parenting in the early years. I've already said that, that those kids that are the most whacked out, the nuts don't fall far from the tree because the parents are probably like that too. Okay, So when you do things with kids, when you're trying to help them be more regulated, what you have to do is you have to teach the parents to be more regulated. Because that's really where it's coming from, is coming from their parents. And I'm not trying to shame and blame. Please don't get me wrong. Some people aren't in control of that. Uh, especially kids that live, or families that live in generational poverty. 
Um, realize that stress can play a, a, a reverse factor on boys and girls. For girls, it's not necessarily going to help them in learning. Where boys, it actually does help them in learning. Boys like to be competitive in general, and girls tend to be more collegial, okay? So if you're going to think about grouping kids, it's okay to group the boys in one group and the girls in another group, especially if there's going to be a competitive nature to it because the boys are going to bowl over the girls. Or the girls are going to be doing more collaborative work with each other or the boys might be doing more competitive work with each other, okay? So like I said, I'm going to jump through these slides real quickly because you can read through this. Um, you know, just here's the facts. 70% of all D's and F's boys. Fewer than half of all the A's, girls, or boys. Two-thirds of LD diagnoses, boys. 90% um, of discipline referrals, boys. Uh, dominate such brain disorders as ADD and ADHD, and I would suggest to you we've over-determined that, and part of that is environmental ADD and environmental ADHD. We've created it because we're not very stimulating, so what they're going to do is they're going to look for stimuli. Okay, 80% of high school uh, dropouts are boys, fewer than 40%, and that number is actually going down. Fewer than 40% of college students are now male, and in fact, that's it's extremely lower for African American males. Um, so you've got some strategies there. It says 25. They're listed in, the, in that handout with a little asterisk behind them. So I've tried to pay attention to the ideas here about safe and non-threatening, engaging the lower part of the brain, the reptilian brain, stimulated and varied, that idea about the parietal lobe, active and meaningful, got to get you up, got to move you around, build neural pathways, and accurate and efficient feedback. If I want you to change, I've got to tell you how to change. Can't just say change, i got to tell you how to change, okay? Um, uh, again, I'm going to jump through the adolescent stuff because I want to get here to race and ethnicity um, on motivation and competence. Mainly motivation and competence is, is just how do I learn? Um, this uh, is from some studies that have been done uh, for a couple of years on uh, uh, specifically African Americans and uh, uh, Latino students. Um, and what the study showed is that people who believe themselves to be chronic targets of others' mistreatment often lose confidence in themselves and their ability to become self-efficacious. What that means is, you keep telling me I'm worthless, I start to believe I'm worthless. Over and over again, I'll believe it. Okay, And if you're constantly being barraged with that information, then you're going to believe it. And what happens is then they start to underachieve and they don't start to perform at the same levels. Personal experience with discrimination in combination with racist mistrust, racial mistrust, can contribute to academic disengagement and other problem behaviors at school. So again, if I don't see people that look like me in school, it's going to be very hard for me to trust because there's a lack of trust being built. And one of the, the issues we have in education today is we don't have enough people that look like our students. And when they don't feel like they're trusted, they will start to underachieve. And it's just a kind of a, a, a negative cycle that happens over and over again. And they will oftentimes be behaviors that they don't even know that they're doing that are negative behaviors. They're doing it because that's the way their brain has been programmed via the group, the people around them. Okay? Because remember, that prefrontal cortex, the emotional stuff that they have up there, the way they respond to the emotions has been cultivated by their community, by their environment, by their parents, and so forth. So it seems to be the key to success for this group of kids is a strong bicultural um, uh, ability, that competence to be able to cross between the two worlds. And you've probably heard about code shifting, if you've heard that before, code shifting. It's, it's code shifting and being able to be conscious of the code shifting. Not unconscious of it, but be conscious of the code shifting. And knowing that it's okay to act one way one place and okay to act another way another place. But that they have strong cultural sensitivities towards themselves. Um, one of the things that we do in my school district in Bloomington is that we have cultural liaisons. And what they do is they work with groups of kids to help them build their own sense of cultural awareness and being okay and being proud of it. Because when you could feel proud of yourself, you now upshift. And now you're more likely to pay attention. You're more likely to offer your ideas and so forth and know that you are a valuable, worthy person. And I think about um, now gifted kids because gifted kids are 
overwhelmingly underrepresented with kids of color and kids living in poverty. Part of that is this bicultural experience is that 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 may not be a safe place because if I'm the only one that looks like me, how do I then represent? And then they become the representative of their culture of all their culture, okay? So having a space where more kids can be work, where we can find more kids of color and more kids from poverty to be in programs such as this, and again, it's kind of the heart, you know, the chicken and egg, you know, that the hard part about it is finding them and then nurturing them along within the program uh, for gifted kids. Children of minority groups with strong ethnic group identity were more motivated to achieve and have a greater repertoire of skills to ward off threats for their competence. What this means is these kids had what's called a growth mindset. There's a great book out by Carol Dweck, D-W-E-C-K, and it's called Mindset. Anybody in here read Mindset? Okay, a couple people. Yeah. What she says in this work is she studied all kinds of people, not just kids of color, but all kinds of people, and what she found is that we have two types of mindset A fixed mindset, whatever you tell me I am, that's what I am. If you said I'm gifted, then I'm gifted. And nothing else is going to change it. If you said I'm not gifted, well, I'm not gifted. Okay, that's called a fixed mindset. Or you can have what's called a growth mindset. You know what, I may not be gifted, but darn it, if I work really hard at it, I'm going to be really successful. Okay, the people that are the most successful in life are the people that have a growth mindset. They've realized what are my challenges, what are the things that I need to overcome, and how do I work hard at things, how do I get over stuff to then become successful. Those kids will actually be the most successful. So in some cases, what we have to do is we have to do some talking with kids to help them, encourage them into a growth mindset. When we base so much of our talk with kids about achievement, we've actually told them the wrong thing. Talk about achievement actually helps set in place a fixed mindset. Because in most kids' minds, achievement is something that's done to me. However, if I can connect the sense of being and the sense of effort, I can actually change the way my brain is processing that information. So if I praise your effort you're more likely to believe it and therefore then change and be able to change that part of your mind and change the way that your mind is processing that information. So helpful strategies that you might want to use with your kids of color that are struggling in school because they're dealing with all of those stressors that you may not even be aware of dealing with that. One of the things you may want to use is the listening techniques of using storytelling in the classroom. Helping kids share their own stories, share your stories. Use personal and practical experiences. One of the things that I mention to teachers all the time, because you want to help kids upshift, you want kids to see you as a real person. I went to Catholic school in New Mexico, and we never saw the nuns as real people. Okay, because they were Franciscans, so we only saw you know this part of their face, and then you know maybe their hands if they weren't wearing gloves. Um, they were totally covered in black. And um, little bird walk here. Uh, the nuns had the, the, because they're Franciscans. They had these uh, rope belts. Okay, and on the ropes were knots uh, as they went down the down the, the side of their gowns, their habits. And I was I, I'm the middle of five kids, and and my two older brothers. Uh, um, just are naturally mean. Older brothers are just naturally mean to little little brothers. And I remember when I was in first grade and my brother was in second grade and the other brother was in third grade. Um, and they would walk me to school and walk me home from school. And one of the first couple weeks in school, um, I remember saying to one of my brothers, um, as we were walking up to the school, okay, we were going to go up the steps into the school, and there was Mother Superior and a couple of the other nuns standing out, of course, greeting everyone, and you know, nuns, they greet you like this with their hands inside their habit, where you can't see anything but their face, and you think they're just floating in space, and so I said to my brother, I said, why do, why do they have those kn- knots on the rope? And my brother said, that's how many kids they ate yesterday. <laughs> Okay, brothers are mean. But what we also 
could never do is we could never find them to be personable because they, that was the old days with nuns. Um, however, when you want kids to help upshift... I don't care what color you are, what you know, how tall you are, what gender you are. When you want kids to help them upshift, you put a picture of you and your dog on the desk or a picture of you and your goldfish. I don't care what it is. A picture with you on hiking, a picture with you or a boyfriend or girlfriend or wife or mother or sister or brother. Put a picture of you with someone else or an animal there that helps kids upshift. Even if you're moving from room to room to room, you carry a picture with you. Because kids need to know you're human. That's what's going to help with this. That friendliness, the sincerity in your voice. Um, having kids become more of a group, a community within the classroom. This is f- proven over and over and over again is the sense of community in the classroom is what actually helps kids to learn because they feel like they're not alone. All right, uh, Using more creativity in the classroom, allowing kids to think outside the box so that they can come up with new and creative ideas. Uh, let me talk to you about poverty here for a couple minutes, the impact of poverty on motivation and competence. And there's that spectrum again. And remember I said that the outer ends we're born with, the inner part of that, of that part of the keyboard is what is developmental. And that's developmental because that's way up here in the prefrontal cortex. We need to teach kids how to be empathetic. We need to teach them how to have patience. We need to teach them how to share. Remember me taking her pen? Well, that's not sharing. Okay? We need to teach kids how to share because sharing is not a natural process for us because we're all about survival. So what we want to do is we want to teach them these things. And again, I go back to my experience with the kids in the Red Lake Indian Reservation and I, as I was putting all of this stuff together, and this comes from the work of Eric Jensen who's a Californian, uh, and, and what I started to realize is these were all of the things that my kids didn't have in the middle school up in Red Lake. They had no sense of optimism. I'll tell you, kids that live in poverty may not see a way out. And I'll tell you, my kids in Red Lake, they're so... It's a a closed reservation, and if if you've ever heard of this term, closed, before. Closed reservation means that you cannot live on the reservation. Uh, and, And oftentimes, you can't live there unless you're a certain percentage Red Lake Indian. Uh, the reservation uh, basically owns everything and then they parcel out a, a, a stipend once a month to each one of the, the members of the tribe. Uh, they're not necessarily a big casino. Uh, it's a very small casino so they're not like the Midwakadan Sioux in Minneapolis that those kids when they graduate from high school get like a, a check for $150,000. I'm not kidding. It's like enormous the amount of money these kids have. Uh, this is where they get a stipend and about $2,500 upon turning 18 and they pretty much blow it all in drugs uh, right away so the, the drug lords are waiting at the door. They, they've got everybody's birth date and they know where to go find them. Um, it's overwhelming. So they're in such generational poverty and as I walk down the hall, this is what I, I do not see a sense of patience. I don't see sharing. I don't see caring. I don't see optimism. And when kids ask, why do I need to know this? And teachers will overwhelmingly say, you're going to need this when you go to college. And they're like, we're not going to college. They're afraid to go off the reservation because it's a foreign country. Same thing happens in New York City where I work with the school in in New York. Um, They're in the the, uh, uh, slums, really slums. It's uh, 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 the Albany houses, which is a, a... three towers of section 8 and those kids come to school every day every day kids are in school but it's the safest place to be because outside the school you know they can be they can be killed or whatever shot uh, and drugs and everything um, those kids have not been off a four block radius in, in south part of Brooklyn and you think they live in the one of the largest the largest city in the world and they've never been off that four block radius they fear going to the subway because it's going into a foreign country okay so we've got to realize that these kids are in downshift so we got to help them which means we need to practice these things so realize they're acting out behavior is giving you a signal 
That acting out behavior is telling you they've not developed those middle parts of the keyboard. They might be impatient, um, impulsive. Uh, There is this gap in politeness, but politeness is not something that's used at home every day. Uh, Their behavioral responses are going to be very limited. Uh, Inappropriate emotional responses, they may swing way high or way low. Uh, And then again, that, that less empathy towards others. So here are some strategies you want to think about in your classroom room that what you want to develop for these kids, and especially as we think about trying to encourage more kids into programs for gifted, is that we want spaces for them that they know where they're going to have a reliable relationship. And that I put that in quotes because in many cases of poverty, there aren't reliable relationships. They don't last very long. And especially male relationships may not last very long because there might be a revolving door of men coming and going in their lives. So using all of those senses of safety and security and respect and all those things, building those relationships with kids, modeling for them what are those behaviors that are expected and it's the constant telling them this is the modeling this is the behavior I'm modeling for you okay Um, whoops you want to help strengthen peer relationships They need to know what it's like to be a friend, how to have friends, how to connect with others, be peers, and learn those things like setting boundaries and setting norms within the classroom. What are the things that are expected? What are what are things that are we're a little more lenient on? The culture of positivity. We're going to be more positive in the classroom. Um, You you want to break down cliques. You want to break down those gangs that are building up within the classroom, Um, and using the language our classroom rather than my classroom, our classroom, because you want that collective nature in the classroom. Uh, You want kids to develop their own sense of self. This really helps them in that sense of building what is called a growth mindset. How do I build up my sense of self? How do I start respecting myself? How do I start understanding who I am? One of the things that uh, I always use in my classroom was helping kids understand what kind of a learner they were. Now, it doesn't tell me that they're a body kinesthetic, therefore you're a body kinesthetic. No, it gives them ideas of the different types of people that are in the room and the different ways that I can respect myself and say, well, this is my unique nature, and that's okay. And I need to know others' unique nature. I want to nurture that sense of, of individual importance, that kids need to feel individually important. You want to think about what are they interested in. The only way that you really can truly engage the brain into learning is when there's a deep sense of interest. The brain pays the most attention to things that are interesting to it. So if I can build a sense of interest, not only do I know what you're interested in, but how do I pique kids' interest to get them to be interested in what it is that I'm going to teach them? Um, that that what you want to do is you want to have a sense of status in the room. Having the person who is the tallest. Having the person who is the most musical. Having the, and you know, you try to make sure everybody finds their unique status within the classroom. That you, because everybody wants to achieve status. Everybody wants to achieve status. We all, we do this naturally. We compare ourselves to others all the time. That's a natural part of learning. You compare yourself to others. When you've truly mastered learning, then you don't, it doesn't matter what others think. Okay, You now have moved up here. However, we want to start them off by giving them senses of status, that everybody needs to have some sort of status. And it needs to be a classroom of celebrations, that we celebrate when we achieve things, we celebrate when we've, we've mastered material and so forth. So I want you to keep in mind very, very you know, succinctly here that the brain is a product of its biology as well as a product of the sociology as well as a product of its culture and a product of its family. Um, It's a product of our histories as well. So keep that in mind, is that that little brain there is not coming to you as just a a, a lump of clay. It's already been molded by all kinds of other things outside of your control. Okay. So I've got a couple of minutes to do questions. Questions, thoughts, ideas, comments. Yeah. Yeah. But in the system 
Okay, and and this is all listed in that that hand at the back page of the handout. There, one of the things that you can do, especially as a woman, limit the amount of words you use every day. Women use far more words than do men. Okay, limit the no, uh, number of words, and also be very consciously aware of the emotional tonality to your language because the one thing that is going to scare off a man is emotion I and I'm not trying to be funny here I'm trying to be serious that the male does not necessarily respond immediately first and foremost to emotions it responds to actions it responds to visuals it doesn't respond immediately to emotions can a man learn to be emotional? Yes. In fact, there's a thing called the daddy brain when the, the male gets to about 28, between about 28 and about 40, it's in what's called the daddy brain. So it's actually in that more emotional state, but that's much later. So boys are going to be thinking more logically, more, more systematically, more step by step by step. So my suggestion is limit the amount of words, use visuals, to share with the steps also because boys have a very hard time with multitasking don't give them more than three steps what age level do you teach for <laughs> no more than three step one when they've accomplished step one now give them step two when they've accomplished step two, give them step three. You may have to break it down for them. Some kids may be able to do all of them, but other kids, you, it, it's, not, it's not a negative. They just need more help with it. Boys have a harder time transitioning. So I guarantee you that if you walk into any school, any, especially middle school, because I see it mostly in middle school because they, they do classroom changes, the kids that have the hardest time settling down from a transition, from coming from the gym, coming from lunch, coming from recess, whatever, the last ones to finally stop bouncing are the boys. What you do is you have to build in that time for the bouncing to settle down. You wait. You give them time to settle down. And you say, I am starting in 30 seconds. And leave it at that. And give them time to bounce down. If they start the minute they walk in the room, their head's still out in the field. Okay, So they need time to settle down. Um, also, uh, uh, make sure that you have natural light in the room. Now, if you're in a tomb like this, it's hard to bring in natural light without busting out a wall. My suggestion is you may want to place your boys, especially the lower reading boys, because here why, here's why boys in general may be your slower readers. Because reading is the most unnatural process to the brain. I'm going to say that again. Reading is the most unnatural process to the brain. Why? Because the written language is only about 2,000 years old. Our brain is millions of years old. Okay? The process of reading requires the talking between the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. The left side of the brain is what is called the text side. So if you look at that word the up there, T-H-E. No, actually let's look at the word brain. B-R-A-I-N-E. The left side of your brain went brain. The right side of the brain is what is called the context side. That's where I image. That's where I put it into a context and say, oh, a brain does this. Okay? If I have a slower processor crossing information from one side to the other and back, I'm going to be a slower reader. This is a fact. Women have a greater, larger corpus callosum. And the corpus callosum is that fiber that runs down the middle between the two sides of the brain, the left side to the right side, right side to the left side. The bigger it is, the more efficient it is. Women have a larger corpus callosum, which means that they can multitask faster, they learn to read typically earlier, they can do multiple things at once, they can hold into their mind the list of things to do, where boys have a harder time doing that. Um, again, I, because I taught primary, I can tell you, most all of my girls came into first grade reading. Only about a third of my boys came in reading. The other two-thirds of them 
just it was a natural process in fact some countries don't even let their boys start to learn to read until about seven years old when that part of the brain is better developed and they don't set into the mindset of those kids I'm a poor reader I'm bad at it what we do is we punish them we we say oh you're bad at reading so I'm gonna do it to you louder and slower in the back of the room when that's not what they need they need more context they need more ways to help their brain cross over from one side to the other okay yeah you were starting to say place the little reading boys oh I'm sorry so yeah so I'm going back here because here I have this image that there's a great big window here so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my boys with their backs to the window why their backs to the window because then they're not going to be looking outside. To look outside, they're going to have to turn around. Okay. Here's the other thing. If you have a child who is ADHD and the child is a male, put the child in the front of the room. If you have a child female that's ADHD, you're going to put her in the back of the room. She needs to hear the language. He needs to see the visuals. Okay, So it's just where you place them. And it's not a punishment, so don't be standing at his desk, tapping on his desk, because all of that stimuli you give him, he's ramping it up 10 or 20 times. Okay, Because she's going to be paying attention to language. Up front, up front, you don't, you don't want to distract her with movement. So you put her in the back. Yeah. 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 Done. Yeah. Yeah. What can I do? Can I give him something like a ball? Yes. Or, you know, like, for my classroom. Sure. Fidgets are a wonderful prop to use with kids that just need stimuli. It's a wonderful prop for them. Uh, one of the things you may want to do is you may want to check kids for comprehension. If they've got it the first time, let them go. And you may, want to, you may want to watch kids that you think are picking it up quicker. Let them go and say, okay, this group of kids, come over here. I'm going to tell it to you one more time. I'm going to go through it more step by step. The rest of you can keep going. Okay? So differentiating in that way where you know some kids can move more quickly and let them go. Especially your brighter kids. Remember, your brighter kids don't need as much practice as does your gen ed kid. Your brighter kid maybe needs maybe three repetitions with it, where your gen ed kids maybe we need ten repetitions with it. This is where we burn out gifted kids. We give them the same number of repetitions that the gen ed kid needs, and they've like, I got it, I got it, you know, and then I'm going to roll out the door. So what you're going to really have to do... <laughs> You're never going to forget Jamal, are you? Um, one of the things you've got to do is you've got to, rem- you've got to be able to identify who picks it up quicker and then can, again, turn and talk. And what you do is you listen as you go through the turn and talk and you listen to the kids and who doesn't get it, you, you kind of move them over and say, okay, you guys over here, the rest of you keep going. Okay? Okay. It is. Oh, it's after six. I'm so sorry. I kept you after late. So thank you, everybody, for being here. Appreciate your time. And um, have a great summer, great rest of the year.